Welcome to special session four of the Shangri-La Dialogue on balancing Asia-Pacific minilateralism and ASEAN centrality. I am Aaron Conley, Senior Fellow for Southeast Asian Politics and Foreign Policy at the IISS, and I'm looking forward to chairing today's pan uh, session. ASEAN's central role in East Asian security architecture is one of the few principles upon which most states in the region ostensibly agree. And indeed, we have already heard several ministers invoke the principle and offer up support for it today. Yet there are different views regarding what ASEAN centrality means and how this principle should be applied. Is it merely respect for ASEAN's convening power as the only regional institution able to bring all the great powers in this region together on an annual basis through the East Asia Summit and its ministerial meetings? Or is there a deeper ASEAN centrality, which would more substantively put Southeast Asian states in the driver's seat? And if so, what steps would ASEAN member states need to take to reach it? Some states see minilateral institutions, such as the Quad, as complementing ASEAN centrality. Others view them as a challenge. Of course, Southeast Asia is no stranger to minilateralism, whether the five power defense arrangements in maritime security in Southeast Asia, or the several regional institutions centered on the Mekong River in mainland Southeast Asia. This special session will examine whether a balance can be found between ASEAN centrality and the new minilateralism, and if so, what that balance might look like. I'm pleased to be joined by our speakers, uh, and I won't uh, read their bios to you because we have uh, such limited time in this session, but they are Dr. Kao Kim Hon, Secretary General of ASEAN, Secretary Jan Adams of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Australia, Senator Lauren Lagarda, the Senate President Pro Tempore of the Philippines, uh, Kun Pompimong Kanchanalak, the advisor to the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs of Thailand. Uh, Emery Trevelyan, the Minister of State Indo-Pacific of the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office in the UK. And finally, uh, Siddhartha Surya Deporo, the Director General for ASEAN Cooperation of the Indonesian Foreign Ministry, and as ASEAN Chair this year, the Chair of the ASEAN Senior Officials Meeting. Just a couple of housekeeping notes on timekeeping, because we have a relatively large panel today. I will be keeping our speakers to time. I'm seated next to a, a presiding officer, so I will try to do my best uh, to be a, a good presiding officer for you all today. And just on the use of the microphone system, if you haven't already, please insert your card into the microphone system uh, and use the speak function on the, uh, on the console, and I will call on you during the Q&A. If you are seated along the sidelines and are a delegate, I'm happy to instruct the, the staff to bring you a, a floor mic if you'd like to ask a question, so just raise your hand. So with that, I will turn over the floor to His Excellency, the Secretary General of ASEAN, Dr. Kao Kem Hon, for his opening remarks for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Aaron Kanali, for your kind introduction. Let me start by greeting to our distinguished panelists, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen. So due to time constraint, I will raise only uh, six, seven points only very briefly, uh, I'm pleased to participate and speak in this uh, session on uh, balancing Asia-Pacific minilateralism and ASEAN centrality. I would just share my view on this uh, topic with the following points. Well, first, uh, in my view, ASEAN has uh, never, and I think will ever, uh, engage in the act of balancing, uh, particularly balancing of power. Uh, what ASEAN is doing, of course, is to uh, seek to engage uh, with external partners. I think basically the power engagement, uh, that's what we do. We don't uh, engage in the balance of power. Uh, I think it's for sure. Uh, we engage with our external partners, uh, particularly at the different levels which we have uh, dollar partners, we have sectoral dollar partners, we have development partners, and other external partners. And that's how we uh, have always been, is to uh, working together, uh, with, uh, of course, in partnership uh, with our uh, partners. So in short, ASEAN does not engage in the act of balancing uh, at all. That's the first point. Second, I think I want to touch on the point of ASEAN centrality. Of course, there may be a different understanding of what constitutes uh, as in centrality, but for us it's very clear what it means. Uh, ASEAN centrality in a way is, uh, you can look at it from a perspective as 
a centripetal force, a force that pulling together, or working together, collaborating together, and uh, not a cent uh, centrifugal force, force that pulling apart or moving from the uh, center to periphery, or working against each other. That's not ASEAN. We're working together. So uh, I think uh, what it means is that ASEAN centrality which means that uh, ASEAN being at the center, at the driver's seat, or being the driving force, particularly in the ASEAN established ASEAN-led mechanism, and of course in the evolving regional architecture. At the moment, we have uh, a number of uh, ASEAN-led mechanisms that have been there for many years already whether I will talk about ASEAN plus one mechanism, ASEAN plus three, uh, ASEAN regional forum, East Asia Summit, ADMM, ADMM plus, among others. And I think the way we have been working is that we're working on the basis of the uh, key principle, and that's of course uh, of, of engagement on the basis of uh, inclusiveness, openness, and transparency. And this has been always the ASEAN modus uh, operandi as a way of uh, working together through the uh, cultural dialogue and the habit of consultation. So uh, I think it's important for us to uh, understand that this has, has been the way. My third point, of course, uh, I want to focus on is uh, ASEAN partnership through the various uh, formal partnership that I mentioned already. This partnership arrangement, uh, basically uh, what we call the circle of engagement, circle of friendship and cooperation. Uh, and, and there are many layers, for example, uh, ASEAN plus one, basically we have ASEAN plus one of our partner, and then we have the ASEAN plus three, then of course with the plus three countries, uh, then of course they also the same partner also in the arrangement, say, of East Asia Summit. So these are the, the way we have structured our partnership, how we uh, focus on our cooperation, how we uh, uh, build our partnership, and uh, and that's how the, the things that we have been working through the various uh, mechanisms of cooperation we have. I want to underline that uh, what is important is that uh, we have uh, many years of uh, being working together. For example, with Japan, we are celebrating 50 year uh, anniversary this year. So 50 years of collaboration. So it's not something that we just uh, do this year or maybe have done on, in the past few years. With Australia, we were celebrating 50 years next year. With the US, this is over 46 years of collaboration. With the EU, also 46 years of capital, uh, collaboration. With China, 32 years. With uh, Republic of Korea, 34 years. So I'm talking about at least a minimum of 30 years onward. So this is really, uh, speak for itself that the fact that we have a track record of collaboration, of working together. Over, over the years. I also want to say that uh, right now, uh, we have also worked uh, across the different sector, but also the, uh, uh, the areas of cooperation. For example, in the economic re uh, area, we have uh, bilateral FTAs with uh, our partners, uh, whether with Japan, Korea, China, India, Australia, New Zealand. And now we're working to also uh, upgrade those ballot FTAs in order to make our economic cooperation become more relevant to our uh, private sector, but also to really to increase trade investment uh, across the board. So this is where we uh, think that this is, uh, will uh, really uh, uh, the basis of our cooperation, that our cooperation has been very much concretized, very specific for mutual uh, benefits. Let me move on briefly to my fourth point, and this is on ASEAN community. The way we work is that it's not just dialogue, not just talk. We have ASEAN community. It's a real community uh, based on the three pillars, the uh, political security, uh, economic, social, and cultural uh, pillars. So these, of course, we not only work uh, among the 10 ASEAN member states, but also with our uh, dialogue partners also across the board as well. And uh, this community has been there uh, for, for, for many decades already. And to really ensure that we uh, provide the benefits uh, to the different stakeholders, particularly the ASEAN people. So that's where I want to uh, also, and of course also 
Uh, we also have sub-regional cooperation arrangement. These are the building blocks of ASEAN community. They are very concrete. Let me move on briefly to my fifth point, and that's, of course, at the moment, ASEAN is working on the ASEAN Vision 2045. So ASEAN is not re uh, reacting, but ASEAN is really planning the future ahead. Very visionary. Uh, something we're looking at 20 years beyond 2025. Looking at the future, how ASEAN should uh, take charge uh, of, of its own destiny in this part of the world. To, so I think this is quite important for us. That's why the leaders have empowered the Hala Task Force on ASEAN Vision Community 2025 to really come up with a long-term vision for the region, how we should uh, 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 take ASEAN forward. So uh, this is something I want. Of course, my uh, next point briefly is on the AOIP, the ASEAN uh, Outlook on the Indo-Pacific. And this is very important for ASEAN because there are so many strategies either putting out by our partners, you know, the strategy on Indo-Pacific. But for us, we have to uh, be in the driver's seat. That's why we have proposed our own AOIP back in 2019. And of course, now we put out the four priority areas of cooperation. We invited uh, all our external partners to cooperate, to work together, uh, to build a region that based on, of course, with, with the clear common agenda, and that's a peace, prosperity uh, for all. I think that's quite important for us. Now, of course, uh, what we expect uh, our partners to do is, of course, to support uh, AOIP, ASEAN Centrality, Peace and Development, and, of course, ASEAN that makes it. Now, make, make, let me move on finally to my last point, okay? Uh, of course, there are growing interests in ASEAN. We have a lot of requests to elevate partnership. We have a lot of requests to uh, forge a formal partnership with ASEAN. Uh, there are a lot of requests, of course, to also to exceed to uh, the, treat, the treat of our MT and Cooperation South Asia, TAC. At the moment, we have, the fifth, uh, we have 50 already. We have a number of countries also to be signed, four more countries to be signed by July this year. So uh, coming back finally on this uh, multilateralism, uh, what we have in the region here, uh, we believe that uh, they are our friends, our partners, and through the various ASEAN uh, established mechanism, lab mechanism, we work together with them. Uh, I don't think it's, uh, they can replace ASEAN, uh, the uh, ASEAN established mechanism at the moment. And of course, uh, I think it's important is that to, under, to underline that uh, all the external partners have accepted and supported uh, ASEAN centrality and ASEAN, ASEAN Centrality is here to stay, to develop, evolve, grow, and strengthen. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary General. Uh, Secretary Adams, you have five minutes. Oh, thanks very much. It's uh, really a great honour to be here today with such excellent company and on such an important uh, topic. Uh, I hesitate to talk about ASEAN history sitting next to Secretary General, but... Uh, uh, I want to start by recalling that uh, ASEAN itself has grown from a grouping of just five countries in the 1960s, when actually peace and stability wasn't taken for granted, uh, to emerge as the enduring central institution, enduring central institution of Southeast Asia. It now brings together partners from around the region and the world to address common challenges. I think the the convening power that you mentioned uh, in the introduction really is very impressive. Uh, yesterday, uh, my Prime Minister unequivocally reaffirmed Australia's commitment to upholding ASEAN centrality, as has Australia's Foreign Minister Penny Wong when she said here in Singapore just last year that ASEAN centrality means that we will always think about our security in the context of your security. ASEAN's role will only become more important as the region faces challenges that individual countries just simply can't address on their own, from climate change to economic dynamics. The ASEAN-Australia Comprehensive Strategic Partnership is, is one example of how we are engaging with the region to support implementation of the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. It's, it's just such a key fundamental document you already referred to uh, in your remarks. Uh, so I guess my uh, really fundamental point uh, is that uh, 
uh, we don't see a tension between or a need to balance ASEAN centrality with minilateral groupings. Uh, the way we see it is uh, more a web of, of groupings uh, as a sign of regional partnership, strength and resilience, reflection of shared aspirations for stability, security and prosperity. Uh, Prime Minister, Singapore, Singaporean Prime Minister Lee uh, observed in March that not every country needs to be in every group, but collectively the different groupings build a resilient and interlocking network of cooperation. That's the imagery that, that w we have in our mind as well. Prime Minister Lee went on to note that these groupings uh, deepen ties between Asia and the rest of the world and this gives external partners stakes in Asia's peace and security. I think it's also really important. So th this uh, integration of, of sort of principle and pragmatism, uh, I think, has long been key to stability in Southeast Asia. Uh, given the, the complex interrelated challenges that we face today, uh, we, we are really interested in focusing on what works and what brings us together. So minilateral groupings uh, do bring countries together with complementary capabilities and, and a shared agenda, shared interests, to cooperate in ways that deliver benefits beyond their immediate membership. So a, a sense of uh, providing uh, common uh, public goods. They can be flexible, they can uh, respond to uh, emerging needs and they can leverage each other's strengths. Uh, there's many examples. Um, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines trilateral maritime patrol to address uh, shared maritime challenges. Five power defence arrangements uh, where we, uh, those five countries have contributed directly to regional security for many years now. Mekong River Commission, minilateral group within ASEAN that convenes dialogue and development partners from around the world. Or the Quad, a diplomatic partnership through which Australia, India, Japan and the United States, who uh, I want to uh, reinforce as all long-standing ASEAN dialogue partners invested in ASEAN success, uh, 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 working uh, also with a um, respect for ASEAN centrality. So the aim of the Quad is to strengthen uh, the, the options, the, uh, the partnerships uh, of regional countries, uh, giving, giving options for countries to uh, work with others, determining their own futures in, a, in an open, stable and prosperous region. Uh, it's doing this through a positive, transparent and practical agenda that actually supports many of ASEAN's own priorities as articulated in the outlook and other strategies. Uh, the recent uh, Quad Summit, uh, a range of initiatives announced that uh, align very closely with the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. Uh, just quickly, uh, clean energy, undersea cable infrastructure connection, the connectivity agenda, uh, high quality, sustainable, climate resilient infrastructure, big, big issue for the region. Uh, health, building on the vaccine initiative, uh, supporting ASEAN's uh, uh, health centre, centre for health security. So these mini lateral groupings, I think, are delivering directly on the priorities ASEAN itself has articulated in the region, and in that sense, uh, do reinforce ASEAN centrality. I'll finish by uh, saying that Australia. Uh, also sees uh, partnerships focused on defence capability development, and I'm here referring to AUKUS in particular, as also making a contribution to regional stability, and in that sense, therefore, also aligning with ASEAN's central objectives. Uh, I think uh, many speakers here today, uh, I've heard already referring to the need for uh, deterrence and reassurance, uh, building capability, building partnerships, investing in capability, investing in relationships. And basically that's the kind of bottom line of what we, uh, of how we see all the work that we're doing in the various uh, mini-laterals uh, with 
with ASEAN ever at the centre and bringing us all together. So thank you. Thank you, Secretary Adams. Senator Lagarde. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak at this prestigious event, the Formal Security Forum in Asia. It brings me back to my early days as a student at the National Defense College of the Philippines uh, 30 years ago, <laughs> uh, when I was taking my master's in national security in my earlier Senate days as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. The ASEAN Charter underscores the importance of ASEAN centrality in its relations with external partners. It emphasizes a central and proactive role of ASEAN as a main driving force in external political, economic, social, and cultural relations and cooperation with external partners. It seeks to position itself in the center of the regional architecture. ASEAN-led regional institutions have allowed ASEAN to routinely engage all major powers of the world to discuss strategic issues, provide a common vision on how to resolve wide-ranging economic, political, security, many other issues. ASEAN has helped shape the balance of power in the region, has led the way in maintaining regional peace, security, and stability. At the ASEAN summit held last month, our president asserted that ASEAN centrality in the summit amidst the geopolitical rivalries in the region. This is also in recognition of the fact that ASEAN has a big role to play in forging regional and multilateral cooperation on various issues, food and energy security, economic recovery, transnational crime, protection of migrant workers, climate change, many others. While this is so, there are issues that affect only some, not all of ASEAN's member states, such as marine issues, which are not relevant, of course, to the landlocked. And this has led to the organization of more and more minilateral arrangements and alternative engagements within and outside of ASEAN. These minilateral arrangements can be seen as a welcome opportunity to initiate discussion among like-minded entities on specific and relevant economic, social, security and defense issues. Minilateral cooperation can thus be seen as an arrangement that can complement and supplement ASEAN regional initiatives. Minilateral groups have played an important role in discussing and pushing forward steps to improve maritime cooperation and enhance maritime security in our region. Within ASEAN alone, the trilateral cooperation among the Philippines, Indonesia and Malaysia proved to be beneficial in improving communications, information sharing, and joint patrols within the area in addressing long-standing piracy issues. The pertinent question then in contemplating a balance is whether minilateralism will replace or strengthen multilateralism. ASEAN experience in navigating this crossroad can show the world the answer. I strongly believe that even with these potential issues, minilateral arrangements must not and will not diminish the significance of ASEAN's role in the region. First, minilateral arrangements still need to include ASEAN in its discussions in order to ensure overall regional security, peace, and stability. Second, ASEAN possesses the mechanisms, experiences, and the institutions that can enhance the discussions to build solutions and strengthen partnerships in various issues concerning the region and beyond. And third, while minilateral agreements, arrangements involve major powers dealing with small countries, ASEAN and the 10 member states could still circle the wagon, so to speak, around each other. This then merits the question, how can minilateral arrangements engage with ASEAN? This is where ASEAN-led institutions come into play. ASEAN-led institutions, including the ASEAN Regional Forum, ARF, ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting, ADMM Plus, East Asia Summit, EAS, ASEAN Plus arrangements have been recognized as entryways for minilaterals. Let me hasten to add in terms of ecological security, the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity can be a means to identify more areas of minilateral cooperation. ASEAN has all the necessary mechanisms 
to welcome minilaterals, but it is equally important for ASEAN to be open to constructive criticism. But we need to remind ourselves of the original intent of ASEAN as expressed by its founders and those countries who are genuinely interested in the stability and prosperity of Southeast Asia and better economic and social conditions will welcome small countries getting together to pull their collective resources and their collective wisdom to contribute to the peace in the world. Let me close by agreeing that bilateralism has its advantages, but ASEAN must be engaged and involved in discussions as it plays its centrality role. I strongly uphold that the involvement of ASEAN and the utilization of its institutions will allow multilaterals to achieve peace and security in a region that would benefit everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lagarda, for those comments. Kun Pampi Mankanchanala, the floor uh, is yours. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Uh, allow me some digression. The concept of ASEAN centrality was first mentioned in uh, 2006 out of the 30th uh, ASEAN Economic Ministers meeting. It called for ASEAN to lead regional cooperation and for non-member nations seeking to engage with the region to be mindful of ASEAN's norms and process. That entails ASEAN serving as the hub of regional multilateral architecture or multi multilateralism or the big tent engagement. Fast forward and many, many regional and global developments in between ASEAN at the present juncture, uh, and even without the official creation of ASEAN as a single market like the EU, represents a sizable production hub and consumer market. The fact that ASEAN has played an instrumental role in keeping peace among its member and that of the sub-region and region, uh, as well as region, made ASEAN a credible multilateral <coughs> mechanism and with it ASEAN's self-confidence and assuredness. The term centrality has been peppered throughout ASEAN's own, docu own documents that reflects such awareness. The ever-expansion number of ASEAN dialogue partners and requests from very many countries to join ASEAN mechanism led some ASEAN officials to say that at some ASEAN annual gatherings, all roads lead to ASEAN. More recently, <laughs> However, ASEAN centrality and effectiveness have been called into question uh, and, um, and um, amidst the new challenges. There are two questions. It involves two questions. One, ASEAN's decision-making process modality that is based on consensus that some described as ASEAN's middle institutional trap. And two, the rise of multilateralism in response to newly emerging strategic challenges. Such peripheration may be further chipping away ASEAN centrality and inertiality earlier renders ASEAN obsolete and for good and for ill its demise. In response to these two existential issues of ASEAN, we should be reminded of the following particulars. One, there is no single multilateral platform that could possibly be expected to be all and in all mechanism. That said, it doesn't mean that multilateralism can be static and oblivious to reform and adjustments. There's no denying that the world is going through its Titan Venda or road turning juncture from the globalization to decoupling to delinking from multilateral cooperation that is based on shared interests to shared political values and system, uh, and some say ver democracy uh, versus non democracy. It is in this context that ASEAN as a preeminent platform for multilateralism in Indo-Pacific and its pivotal role in shaping the new regional security architecture should be focused. Multilateralism and minilateralism are not mutually exclusive and they serve different purposes and have different functions. And for that reason, they could be mutually supplementary. My minilateralism cooperation, be it bilateral, trilateral, quadrilateral, currently exists within ASEAN in many forms, as mentioned by many on, on this panel, and I won't go into it anymore. And uh, 
because of this uh, minilateral within ASEAN, it allows ASEAN countries to respond effectively to opportunities and challenges in their global uh, geopolitical environment <coughs> and to overcome inherent weaknesses in ASEAN as a multilateral corporation. The question remains, nonetheless, regarding how well ASEAN embraces minilateralism, which have shown growing willingness and role to proactively address regional challenges, as well as the eagerness of major powers to assert their will on the region. Two, minilateral is ad hoc, issue-based and specific purpose cooperative arrangement, while multilateral is more inclusive, encompassing diverse political regimes, level of economic development, and socio-religious orientation. Multilaterals possess three key powers that minilateral cannot rival. They are the economic power, market power, and most, well, first among equal, the convening power. ASEAN decision process is based on consensus, not unanimity, and two are, are not the same thing. It is ASEAN strength, not weakness, because it allows ASEAN to be nimble and agile and light-footed without being lightweighted. Ultimately, it has served ASEAN members' interests and region well for 56 years. Consensus never entails effectiveness. Well, what it does is it ensures that decisions arising therefrom are not hair-brained and haphazard. New decision process modalities of ASEAN <coughs> have been proposed and discussed, but none has gained serious traction. Four, ASEAN centrality is and its relevance and role are not threatened by multilateral, but by ASEAN's own unity and cohesiveness. It's also, uh, also related to ASEAN centrality is a question of how well ASEAN serve the members' respective foreign policies. Five, ASEAN endeavor and undertaking in finding a peaceful political solution to the Myanmar conflict could entail the future of ASEAN and its place as a hub of multilateral architecture in a broader, uh, and a broader Indo-Pacific uh, or Asia-Pacific region. And as uh, Secretary Lloyd Austin said distinctly this morning, dialogue is not an award. It is a necessity. Thank you. Thank you, Kum Pompimon. Minister Trevelyan. Good afternoon, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you in Singapore and to join this uh, very distinguished panel. Uh, I'm glad to have the opportunity to set out the ways in which the UK is deepening our cooperation with you, our partners, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, this work is important to us all, not just because this global growth hub plays a huge role in our shared security, freedom and prosperity, but because of its central importance in tackling some of the most pressing global challenges from climate change to managing the transformational impact of cutting-edge technologies such as AI. The UK's commitment to the Indo-Pacific is deepening at pace across trade, defence, climate action and more. We're delighted to be an ASEAN dialogue partner and we're excited to be joining the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. We hugely value and respect the central role that ASEAN plays in promoting cooperation and shaping the wider Indo-Pacific regional order. In particular, ASEAN's outlook on the Indo-Pacific provides a clear and welcome steer on how we can best work together with you, underpinned by those shared priorities such as transparency, respect for sovereignty and international law. As a dialogue partner and a country committed to multilateralism, the UK places huge importance on listening to others' views and ensuring that we shape our approach accordingly. We know that these genuine, trusted partnerships are the key to success. But if we look at some of the minilateralist relationships in the region, firstly around climate action, we are excited to be working with Indonesia and Vietnam, who are demonstrating great leadership in implementing new just energy transition partnerships with international support, driving a clean energy future for the region. These, we believe, bring value not only to the bilateral countries in question, but a positive impact for ASEAN too. Secondly, on maritime cooperation, an area of particular importance to us as a maritime trading nation, 
we are developing with Southeast Asian partners an ambitious programme to build capacity and boost training on vital issues from protecting the marine environment to upholding maritime law. We are also making a practical contribution to the region's maritime security today. In 2021, two offshore patrol vessels, HMS Tamar and HMS Spey, began their long-term deployment to the Indo-Pacific. These crews of young Royal Navy sailors have been discovering anew the maritime complexity of the region and building strong new bonds of friendship. We will be deploying a littoral response group to the region next year to add further support and depth to the UK's commitment. And following HMS Queen Elizabeth, our fifth generation aircraft carrier, and her strike group's visits in 2021, we will be sending another carrier strike group to the Indo-Pacific in 2025. Meanwhile, on Myanmar, the UK has focused on helping to unite the international community behind support for the ASEAN Five Point Consensus, including the landmark UN Security Council resolution agreed last December. We are proud to be the penholder at the UN, and we will continue to bring all our efforts to support solutions. Because the complex challenges facing the Indo-Pacific require a multifaceted response. The UK respects and supports ASEAN's central role, both in enabling cooperation between its members and in anchoring the wider regional security architecture. Within our ASEAN plan of action, which is now up and running, uh, are a series of practical ASEAN-wide programmes. In addition, smaller groupings can also be effective in driving some key issues more quickly. For the UK, what is important is that these initiatives are guided by a shared vision and a shared respect for the principles of openness, good governance, respect for sovereignty and respect for international law. Whether we are engaging with our partners collectively, bilaterally or as part of a smaller group driving action on urgent issues, the UK's commitment to transparency with ASEAN partners remains unwavering. Perhaps most clearly if we look at AUKUS, uh, through which we are supporting Australia in their regional defence and security responsibilities, bringing our decades of experience to help and accelerate collaboration on advanced military technologies with them and the US. Is it geopolitically significant? Yes. Is it an alliance? No. Does it support security and stability in the Indo-Pacific? a goal to which ASEAN is also committed, absolutely. So this is why I was so pleased to see Indonesian President Widodo's comments that AUKUS and the Quad are partners, not competitors to ASEAN. We wholeheartedly agree. Looking to the future, the UK is committed to playing an even fuller and more active role in promoting and supporting a free and open Indo-Pacific alongside other ASEAN dialogue partners. And this is why we have applied to join the ASEAN Defence Minister's Meeting Plus and the ASEAN Regional Forum. We will continue to deepen our cooperation with ASEAN through our five-year plan of action, advancing our shared priorities on security, the economy and some of the biggest global challenges of our time. Together, we know that we continue to build a more stable, peaceful and prosperous future for all. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And last but not least, the current ASEAN Chair, uh, Siddhartha Sergio de Poro, the Chair of the ASEAN Senior Officials Meeting and Director General for ASEAN Cooperation of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Um, good afternoon to uh, everybody. Um, I'm the last speaker, so um, and I agree with all the points raised by previous speakers. Um, but I will just add to, to their points uh, by raising uh, three issues about centrality. Uh, one is um, what do we mean by centrality? Uh, second is uh, uh, the, uh, the, the history of it, just to have a same understanding. And third of uh, as chair of 2023, what, what we are doing. So on the first um, centrality, um, I agree with what uh, the Secretary General mentioned. Um, and I would like to say that centrality, when we talk about centrality, basically we are talking about three interlocking concepts, uh, geographic centrality, uh, institutional centrality, and diplomatic centrality. And this, I think this is uh, where we, uh, throughout the dis discussion on centrality, uh, will touch one or more um, of the centrality uh, aspects. Uh, the second, uh, a bit on the history, 
the centrality of ASEAN, it really came about uh, with the joining of the CLMV uh, in the late 90s, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Vietnam. I don't think that um, uh, without them, there will be centrality that we have today. Um, it does create uh, certain issues of uh, unity, um, but it is um, unity is also a process. And ultimately, unity and centrality um, are two sides of the same coin, and one would depend on the other. Um, also, centrality in the context of history is that uh, the ASEAN member states, uh, what brings them together, this is, after all, a region of fractured geographic uh, setting, but what brings them together also is that uh, 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 the, the effort to forge a common identity. And of late, I've, I've come to think that it is also a wish to avoid uh, a repeat of uh, um, historical traumas, trauma of being the proxy uh, of the Cold War. And I think all ASEAN member states, uh, one way or another, would, would have uh, such a history. Um, another aspect of uh, centrality is that it is ASEAN, for the most part, a maritime region. Uh, it straddles uh, one of the most, uh, one of the most uh, strategic waterways um, uh, in the world. Uh, major powers have an interest in uh, these waters in Southeast Asia and through Southeast, Southeast Asia. Uh, their security, their prosperity depends on that access to and through Southeast Asia. And I think also for this reason that uh, major player, players, uh, those that uh, today form uh, minilaterals like the Quad and uh, the AUKUS, uh, have been a long contributor of, of the ASEAN process. Um, you know, earlier we talked about uh, um, celebrating 50 years. Uh, so with Japan this year, we are celebrating 50 years of relationship. With Australia next year, we'll be celebrating it. Um, and, and the US uh, last year, we celebrated 45 years. So uh, these uh, countries contributed to centrality of uh, ASEAN. Um, and it's important to note that it is not the first time for ASEAN to be operating uh, in a common geographical space uh, with minilaterals. Uh, John Adams, uh, the Secretary of DFAT, mentioned uh, earlier um, about uh, some of the um, uh, uh, some of that uh, history. Um, in the past, um, we shared the same geographical space uh, with the American Alliance System or with the Mekong uh, subregion. Um, and ASEAN, um, the, the unique factor of ASEAN is that um, it is the only open and inclusive mechanism. And this is the kind of mechanism that you need to address a security dilemma. Um, existing uh, groupings or minilateralism may add to security dilemma, but it is ASEAN, uh, the, the inclusive platform, that can help address uh, the security dilemma. Um, now turning to another aspect of centrality, it's actually the economic centrality. Um, almost 700 million people with uh, one of the highest rate of growth for a sub-region, um, and also with uh, the third highest uh, destination of foreign direct uh, investment. Um, and there is a lot of promise of this um, economic growth. Um, and of course, ASEAN is the driver of the uh, regional comprehensive economic partnership. Now turning to uh, my second point, that is on the chairmanship. Uh, what are we focusing on, on the basis of that uh, centrality? Uh, so the theme of Indonesia's chairmanship, um, as you probably know, is ASEAN Matters, Epicentrum of Growth. Um, this is another way of saying unity and centrality are two sides of the same coin, and it must be uh, useful for its people, for its economy, um, and also for uh, regional stability and prosperity. Um, so internally, uh, we must ensure that ASEAN is useful. That's why at the uh, 42nd ASEAN Summit in Labuan Bajo uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, ASEAN adopted um, a declaration on trafficking in person and abuse of technology. Um, it addressed uh, migrant uh, issues, uh, including migrant fishers, uh, 
um, and also establishing an ecosystem for uh, electric vehicle, seeking to become a center um, of uh, electric vehicle. Um, at the same time, uh, for the rest of the year, uh, we are conscious that centrality requires ASEAN to strengthen its uh, institutional setup. This includes the decision-making process. Uh, previous speakers talked about, uh, and especially Pauline talked about the decision-making uh, process. Uh, ASEAN Vision 2045 was mentioned by the uh, Secretary General. Uh, what's important to note, um, ASEAN Vision 2045, is that um, it would be 100 years that Southeast Asia became independent, or putting it another way, 100 years uh, since colonialism. So basically, our future uh, is in our own hands. Uh, we cannot blame former colonial powers. Uh, we decide on our own uh, future. That is the purpose of ASEAN Vision 2045. Um, and then in uh, seeking to strengthen its uh, uh, centrality uh, this year, um, we are working to strengthen a relationship with our partners in the um, East Asia Summit uh, uh, member states. Um, and that would include um, strengthening, uh, the, you know, there's this grouping of EAS ambassadors in Jakarta. Uh, so it's a question of how we can make this grouping more responsive uh, to uh, developing issues uh, in the region. We want to strengthen uh, the ASEAN Secretariat. We want to strengthen the uh, ASEAN premises uh, in Jakarta so it can better serve all these diplomatic processes. Um, and we, we are talking about resources for ASEAN, uh, how it will be better resourced from uh, mobilization in ASEAN itself. Um, and also, we are going to hold what we call the uh, ASEAN Indo-Pacific Forum to implement the AOIP, ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific. Um, previous speakers talked about the ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific. Now, this forum is an opportunity uh, for ASEAN member states, for our partners, the private sectors, to come to invest in the ASEAN, uh, not only in terms of uh, investment in infrastructure, in financing, and others, but also um, investment, um, a more strategic investment in terms of relationship, and investment in creating that strategic space um, in the ASEAN, ASEAN region. And we intend to work on this um, uh, post-2025 into something that is more sustainable, so um, uh, some friends would put it in the context of uh, comprehensive security, uh, but the way we put it is uh, AOIP um, and also the uh, ASEAN Indo-Pacific Forum. Thank you. Um, finally, um, I'd just like to mention uh, one more thing, that in the maritime sphere, I talked about it, um, and this goes beyond our chairmanship here. Um, in ASEAN, we are strengthening the ASEAN Maritime Forum and uh, East um, uh, Expanded ASEAN Maritime Forum. Uh, this year, we are establishing for the first time an ASEAN Maritime Outlook that brings together uh, all the work on, on uh, ASEAN in the maritime sphere. Um, and finally, um, how do we, this is a question of how do we uh, strengthen the stability and predictability in the maritime sphere. Um, and this would require, uh, first, uh, concluding the code of conduct in the South China Sea. Uh, we are working in ASEAN and our uh, Chinese partners to intensify negotiations. Uh, we need to start pondering on the question of a code of conduct among the major powers. Um, and this is the more urgent issues uh, today. Um, there is a need for maritime dialogue among the major powers, uh, in particular between U.S. Uh, and, and China. Uh, and just to note that the region, the last time the region saw any talks on limitation of uh, naval forces was almost a, more than 100 years ago with the Na uh, Washington Naval Conference in 19, 
2021. Um, and finally, uh, people are talking about deterrence, but it is a question of how to achieve deterrence at the lower level of armaments. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Pak Arto. Uh, I will take a round of questions from the floor. Uh, I would ask you to please keep your questions brief and succinct and to direct them to one of the panelists. We'll then come back to the panelists for brief answers. And then in the last 15 minutes of the session, we'll come back to all of them for brief concluding remarks. So I'll take a first round of questions. Uh, and first up is Senior Colonel Shen. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Chao. Um, and actually, I um, am deeply impressed by the speakers. And uh, you talk about uh, the centrality of ASEAN and also the mini natural and uh, clari clarify many my, uh, the mis misunderstanding of for these uh, uh, two s concepts uh, in, uh, for me. Uh, but here, I actually I was enlightened by the, uh, the last speaker and your the first word, you, uh, the first sentence, you, 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 see, you said that, is that what we mean by centrality. Actually, I want to ask that what we mean by mini natural. And I think that uh, we discussed today, uh, we should make clear what's the meaning, what's the meaning of uh, mini natural. Uh, so is it a kind of uh, multinatural? Or if it is, so why should we necessary to make a new word? the mini natural. And so if it is not, so why call it mini? So I think, in my opinion, the meaning, firstly, it means that the, the members of it are limited. So there are only uh, are several of them. Well, this, the other, another aspect is that the areas of uh, it cares about or deals with are focused on many one single issue for that, yes? So that's my understanding. So to some extent, it means it is exclusive and rather than inclusive. Um, the, the cooperation is limited and uh, it normally has a very small and a clear target. Yes. So uh, some, and actually uh, I believe that I fully agree with uh, the speakers that some of the um, mini natural organizations are very necessary to cope with the regional issues, but uh, I don't think all of them are necessary. So uh, my question, I actually, uh, so multinaturalism is not, uh, so mini naturalism is not multinaturalism in its real meaning or in, in its real sense. Um, so I, my question, I goes to my question and uh, my question goes to the uh, speakers from uh, Asian countries, and I actually impressed or not from his, uh, your speech. That is, uh, we know that a very typical mini natural is the orcas. So, how the Asian view the orcas? What are the <coughs> challenges of the orcas to Asian and the regional security? Uh, what are the possible uh, influence of it to the regional security, and how will the Asian uh, could uh, handle the challenges posed by the occurs in light of uh, the uh, Asian Vision 2045. So that's my question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senior Colonel. And next up is Gregory Poling. Thanks, Aaron. Um, actually, a somewhat similar question, I suppose. I'd like to press all of or any of the speakers a little bit if they could. I, um, I still don't think if somebody asked me to define what makes a minilateral agreement supportive of or um, in conflict with ASEAN centrality, I'd be able to give them any list of criteria. It's not date. There's plenty of organizations both before and after 2006 that have been minilateral, either involving or not involving ASEAN members. It's not the issues it touches on. There's some involving, there's four at least that I know of, uh, large groupings involving the Mekong, multiple involving counter piracy or maritime security. You've got um, outside parties engaged in digital economy agreements, right? So it, it stretches across the, the spectrum. In some cases, you've had minilateral institutions that have then fed into the ASEAN process through things like the ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific. So are there specific examples that you would point to now of a minilateral organization that clearly is a threat to ASEAN centrality? Um, and if not, like, what would the checklist be 
of characteristics that separate good and bad, or threatening and non-threatening unilateral arrangements vis-a-vis Alfian centrality. Thank you. Thanks, and next we'll go to Meli Caballero Anthony from the Philippines. Thank you. Um, I want, there's a, it's very um, tempting to talk about centrality, um, minilateralism and as a threat to ASEAN centrality, but my question is more on the centrality part of ASEAN because I was curious when um, uh, pa, um, <coughs> Pat Chair from Indonesia was saying that central, unity is so critical to ASEAN centrality, but we all know that at the moment, especially on a particular issue, and this could carry on to other issues, that ASEAN is not united, and there's existing fractures within ASEAN. So isn't that more a threat to centrality rather than minilaterals like AUKUS and Quad? Thank you. And that is for all ASEAN, whoever wants to take it. Thank you. Uh, and next, uh, General Nem Sawate. Thank you, Chair, for giving me the floor. And my respect to Dr. Kakum Hoon. Um, my question actually goes to um, the panel. Uh, with respect to um, resources allocation and management, um, be it human resources, economic funds, and times, basically, also, um, what would you say be the number one challenge for um, posed by minilateralism arrangements to ASEAN centrality, and um, and how do AMS and um, other members who are participating in the arrangements address this number one challenge? Thank you. Dr. Shona Lung from the IISS in Singapore. Hi, thank you very much. My question is specifically for Kun Pompimo. Um, you mentioned in your talk that consensus does not equate to unanimity. And I was curious if you could clarify what that meant, specifically in relation to the Myanmar conflict, which I think affects all ASEAN states, but in very different ways. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lung. And uh, Dino Pati Jalal from Indonesia. Me first? Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Look, I, I get the point that for ASEAN centrality to work, ASEAN has to get along with everybody, yeah, with uh, China, U.S., uh, Japan, Korea, India, and so on, right? So I, I get that point. I know that's necessary. But I'm just wondering, is it possible for ASEAN to go beyond that, to go to the next level? What I mean is this. There's Quad, and Quad does not threaten ASEAN. Quad has excellent relations with individual ASEAN countries. And then there's China. China wants to court ASEAN, and China has excellent relations with, relatively speaking, with each ASEAN country. I think the biggest strategic contribution that ASEAN can make is if ASEAN uses that political capital with regard to China and Quad countries to try to say to China, hey, you know, Quad's not so bad, right? Quad of today is not quad of uh, uh, Pompeo time, uh, 2019, when he was ranting against China and CCP and so on, right? Uh, and China will listen if ASEAN says so. I mean, the proof is that China has now accepted AOIP within the context of ASEAN China, right? So China's position is moving, right? And there are plenty of other examples where China is m willing to move its position if ASEAN talks to China about it, right? So I, I would think that the next big contribution of ASEAN, if it can use its political capital with regard to Quad countries and China, to try to uh, ease the positions of both to the point that, uh, I'm sure it's not too, ask, too, too, too hard to ask, to the point where Quad and China would soften their position towards each other because their rhetorics are there, right? Their rhetorics are there on both sides, uh, but they just need something to nudge them in that direction in more decisive way. And I think ASEAN is a country, is, is the organization that can do so. Thank you, Pat uh, Dino. Uh, Jain Chang. Thank you. Um, so ASEAN often talks about process. So my questions have to do with process. Um, firstly, um, you know, 
when, you talk, when we talk about asset centrality, if, we, if someone, some actor doesn't like how asset centrality is going, you know, do, is there some sort of sticker like you see at the back of the truck, you know, how, how's my driving? Who do you call, right, to say, well, we want centrality to move in a different way? Um, if centrality is going in a, not, not the so how, but the direction is going in a way that uh, some actor doesn't like, um, they say, well, you know what, we don't want to go drive, with ASEAN being the driver, we don't want to drive off the cliff, Thelma and Louise style, who do we call? What do we do? Um, and finally, uh, when we think about centrality, um, we've talked about lots of challenges. So what is ASEAN going to do when centrality is challenged? And in fact, what are the other partners going to do? Thanks. Uh, and last but not least, from Thailand, Kun Titinam Pansudra. Um, thank you. Look, I think uh, a couple of questions. Uh, first, building on uh, Meili's point about the challenges of uh, ASEAN centrality, I mean, you have the, um, the Quad, AUKUS, uh, uh, many laterals, but also the lack of unity itself is also a, a challenge to ASEAN centrality. I think that it's, uh, uh, it's convenient and it's uh, very workable to kind of uh, gloss over that and say that, you know, the Quad and, and AUKUS can be compatible with, uh, with ASEAN centrality, but in fact, it is not. It is not. I mean, the, the aims and the direction and the nature of Quad and AUKUS uh, are aim, you know, have very different objectives. It has China in its sight. Uh, ASEAN is about kind of weaving in all the different players into the same, uh, the same forum and with ASEAN as, as kind of the center of action. So my first question is about the, the compatibility. How can you make it, you know, explain this compatibility of uh, Quad and AUKUS with uh, ASEAN centrality? Second question has to do with the uh, the divisions within ASEAN. You know, ASEAN has been divided in the past before. Uh, when great powers are in, uh, in relative balance and at relative peace, uh, you have ASEAN uh, unity, relative unity and effectiveness. But when the great powers are not in uh, balance and not at peace, uh, this is when ASEAN is divided. So, uh, you know, we might have to think about, would, th would this be a time to start thinking about different modalities of uh, ASEAN uh, uh, moving forward, uh, you know, it's mentioned here ASEAN minus X, but, uh, but perhaps ASEAN plus, ASEAN 5 plus X. If you look at the original five, they are much more aligned on Ukraine, uh, Russian Ukraine, on Myanmar, uh, a range of issues. Uh, if that can be the, the new core foundation of ASEAN cent centrality moving forward, uh, that might be, would that be something that we should be thinking about? Thank you, Kun Titinan. Um, I'm going to come back to all of our speakers now, just because I think there was at least one question for every speaker, and I'll go back in the order that we started. So, uh, Secretary General, Dr. Cao. Well, thank you very much. I have listened very carefully, and I found those questions to be extremely useful, thought-provoking, and uh, something that we have to think uh, through very carefully. But let me respond Maybe it's just a, a general, because there's a lot of questions uh, more or less linked to one another. Well, first on ASEAN minus X. This will not fly, I can tell you already. There's been enormous discussion with ASEAN. This ASEAN minus X has been, I would call, uh, something that a uh, member state will not entertain. It will be something that will lead to a complete division within ASEAN. So that's why in the process of the drafting of ASEAN Charter, there were a lot of discussion at all levels from the drafters to the leaders. Uh, only in, in a few, uh, maybe one instant that uh, was applied in the economic arena, I think particularly Thailand that uh, at the time would be negotiated bilateral FTA between ASEAN and Republic of Korea. And Thailand could not agree on a rise. And I think uh, we agreed that okay to allow uh, Thailand uh, to come on board later on when it's ready. So that was the only instant that it took place, uh, or, or ASEAN minus X, basically Thailand that agreed to, uh, uh, to allow nine other ASEAN member states to move ahead on the bar FTA with Korea, for example. But, uh, okay, on the, uh, I would say, uh, these uh, mineral, uh, min, mineral groupings, we have many within ASEAN, but also we have many others outside of ASEAN, but also in the region. When in ASEAN we have, for example, CLV, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam. We have sub-regional Mekong arrangements, right? There's many of them. 
whether within uh, those uh, mainland ASEAN or maybe between uh, Mekong and of course also dialogue partner with Mekong Japan, Mekong Korea, Mekong China, Mekong India, for example, there's many. Also uh, among the maritime states of ASEAN, we have uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, economic uh, triangle, for example. Uh, and of course this morning we heard from uh, US Secretary, State, uh, Secretary of Defense propose a new uh, chilateral arrangements. We heard about uh, US, Japan, Korea for the first time. Uh, of course, we heard about uh, August, uh, US, Australia, UK, for example, it's been there. We have also heard about uh, other arrangements that's been there. But of course, uh, again, um, I, I think the point was made by one of the uh, participants just now is that what's important is what is the goal, the strategic goal of each sub-regional grouping, what are they trying to do? as long that will promote peace, stability of the region, not to undermine uh, what we're doing in the region here. I think that's important. Uh, and of course also, uh, yes, I think the question from Dr. Mali about whether uh, uh, the lack of unity is, uh, would be a threat to ASEAN Central more than anything else. I don't think it's a lack of unity in ASEAN. It is to be expected for any regional organization to have internal challenges. Uh, I don't think we can expect a perfect regional organization to have on this planet. We all have our own uh, external and internal challenges. But how we manage those challenges to come about in the final uh, uh, destination that we will, will break, of course, will strengthen ASEAN. Of course, we have Myanmar issue there, but uh, we don't expect Myanmar issue be to be uh, there permanently. Uh, of course, will be maybe a temporary challenge, but I think this is something that how we learn to navigate, to manage our own internal differences. Uh, that's why we've seen uh, recently at the 42nd ASEAN uh, summit in Labo Mejo, Indonesia, leaders, despite they have a lot of differences and views, but in the end they come to a, the common, uh, the common ground on how to move forward to engage Myanmar. And of course, for example, uh, there was initial discussion on. Uh, the level of engagement and all that. But in the end, they say, we cannot isolate Myanmar. The ASEAN must continue to engage in Myanmar. But engagement does not mean ASEAN uh, recognize or legitimate the current regime there, for example. So I think, uh, once again, I think it's that uh, ASEAN is 56 years old. It has gone through many uh, ups and downs. And, and I agree with uh, our Indonesian colleague, uh, uh, some leader from Indonesia, the chair, is that, you know, uh, we have now ASEAN 10, and ASEAN 11 is already just about to be born in a matter of time. And uh, the entire region is basically, we have to work together on the community building. And this community building cut across the different sectors, they are the spider web of strengths not uh, of a disunity. And I think moving forward is that we have to continue to strengthen ASEAN institutions, uh, ASEAN uh, community building process, ASEAN integration, that will strengthen ASEAN even further. Of course, we have to work with our external partners. This is the nature of ASEAN. Uh, within our own arrangements, but also across the different areas of interest. And I think it's important that uh, we have to continue to engage in uh, strategic trust uh, strengthen uh, strengthen trust, but also in confidence building. And on top of that, of course, ASEAN will continue to work on uh, conflict prevention and return reduction. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary General. Uh, we uh, only have uh, limited time remaining, so rather than going back for another round of questions and then concluding remarks, we'll just consider this the concluding remarks. Uh, and I'll give each of the remaining speakers four minutes. So Secretary Adams, you have four minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I'll be brief. I'll, I'll respond to two of the issues that have been raised in the questions. Uh, the first is um, uh, whether AUKUS is seen by people uh, on the panel as a challenge to regional security, a challenge to ASEAN. I just want to make the point that Pillar 1 of AUKUS, this, the um, 
which is the cooperation between UK, US, and that will allow Australia to replace uh, some to replace our existing submarine fleet, which is diesel powered, with uh, more uh, efficient nuclear powered submarines. Neither of these submarine capabilities will have nuclear weapons. China, of course, as Senior Colonel Shen knows, is a nuclear uh, weapons state and has already nuclear weapons in nuclear submarines and, in fact, is building stocks that are giving rise to some questions about what exactly those stocks are to be used for. My second uh, question uh, that I'll respond to is the one about uh, overlapping uh, what makes them complementary, what makes them a threat. I think I want to uh, highlight points already made about the, by Dino and uh, Secretary General Cow about what makes, uh, what makes it complementary. Two things, uh, whether the objectives are aligned, the fundamental objective of peace and security, but also more specific objectives, uh, if I mention some quad activities on secure clean energy supply chains, infrastructure, climate resilient infrastructure, health security, uh, etc. So content. And second, as Dino says, um, you know, institutions, even the, these minilaterals often don't have any institutional structure. So really it comes down to the relationships between the constituent member countries. So, as you, you, you very nicely said, there's good relations with all of these countries in all of the constellations, so how can it be a really very fundamental challenge to regional security? Thank you. I would like to liken the issue of minilateralism, multilateralism, and ASEAN centrality, where this refers to security and defense, to economic partnerships and trade. For after all, the issue of security does not rely only on defense and military. It could be environment, economic security. What I'm referring to is the um, Regional Cooperation Economic Partnership Agreement, RCEP, where the Philippines was the last to accede uh, just a few months ago, which is an ASEAN, uh, Japan, uh, China, Australia, and New Zealand economic partnership, as you all probably know. Uh, this is an ASEAN with those four, plus four. But the Philippines has had many previous FTAs with various countries, including the JPEPA, which was concurred in by the Senate uh, more than 10 years ago. I do not think that any economic partnership agreement between the Philippines and another country or a group of countries, even outside of the Indo-Pacific region, would destabilize trade and economic partnerships in a region. And I think if that is um, very clear in terms of economics and trade, this is how I feel with um, security and defense as well. Minilaterals can only enhance uh, the centrality of ASEAN and for as long as ASEAN is involved in the minilaterals of some countries, like I mentioned about Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines, in terms of our minilateral arrangement in maritime, which of course is not um, applicable to the landlocked countries, for as long as these ASEAN nations uh, are transparent about um, talks and discussions and arrangements with other countries, then I believe that minilaterals, in fact, can enhance ASEAN centrality. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kun Pompimon. Um, first, I'd like to answer the question on the difference between consensus and uh, unanimity. Uh, consensus is a situation when a decision is reached with no dissenting voice, but it doesn't mean that everybody agrees. That's how we reach consensus on the five-point consensus in April, uh, uh, right after the two months after the coup in Myanmar. Uh, two, I like to stress that unity, uh, support Park Ato, that uh, unity and centrality are two sides of the same coin, and uh, uh, without unity, our centrality will be 
threatened, not the minilateralism. And uh, third, the, what is uh, critical to ASEAN going forward is how proactive ASEAN is, uh, and we are not caught on the back foot. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I may, the, the challenge that the aims of AUKUS uh, clashes with the uh, mission to weave all the players together uh, is one that I would disagree with, because I think if we look, and as Jan has just set out, um, in terms of the replacement of a submarine fleet, uh, that's part of a uh, maritime security program, which uh, Australia uh, brings as part of its commitment to regional security, supporting uh, many of the smaller countries, uh, many of whom, of course, in ASEAN, who uh, are not perhaps able uh, to provide the, the level of maritime security required for that regional stability. But the challenge, exactly as you say, of, of a consensus organisation, uh, this central uh, point about ASEAN, which is an extraordinary uh, thing, and it, hel it held, held together for uh, you know 60 years with this central point, which is... Uh, that sometimes that consensus organisation isn't going to be the one to deliver most effectively uh, the solution to an urgent problem, perhaps, where perhaps just a few uh, members are the ones to do that, or where a particular expertise uh, needs to be brought together, uh, some of the uh, multilateral groupings around energy transition uh, or technical development, uh, the logic of bringing together uh, those willing members who want to together move a project on at pace doesn't in any way detract from those values, values that ASEAN has set out so clearly. Um, they remain central, I think, in all the multilateral groupings that may come together and then indeed dissipate once the problem or the challenge has been solved. They're always focused on that. And I think to remember that within the consensus uh, methodology, what are those values that they sit there around a shared vision for the region, for ASEAN, for this extraordinary part of the world with all its huge... Uh, opportunity and indeed challenges and their respect for uh, each partner's part in that but in meeting the challenges around security helping the prosperity uh, gender to achieve and I think a word that's rarely used uh, in uh, multilateral groups of which I've sat in many uh, over the years is that it's about friendship and that's a really important and different word that you've all often used uh, which speaks to what is this important ASEAN family and those of us who are not in it directly, but as uh, dialogue partners and other minilateral uh, partnerships can support and help sustain meeting those really important goals and visions. Thank you, Minister. Director General. Thank you. Um, uh, two points to make. Um, the first, um, whether uh, minilateralism is a threat to ASEAN centrality. Let me uh, put it in the context of um, um, uh, prosperity and uh, stability. On the stability side, it is a question about, uh, because this is a maritime region, primarily a maritime region, so it is about strengthening uh, maritime governance. Um, I, sh I shared some ideas about how to strengthen this um, uh, maritime governance, including uh, maritime dialogue among the, the major powers. ASEAN itself needs to look uh, also um, into it. It has some mechanism to do so, but uh, ASEAN is at the early stages of, of uh, doing it. And then on the prosperity side is that how the uh, minilaterals can contribute to the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, um, including on the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Forum to implement the AOIP. And this is a, a way of um, participating uh, not only to contribute uh, to the uh, development in ASEAN, but again, this is a region of almost 700 million people, one of the highest rate of growth. Um, and centrality was based on, continues to be based on uh, all countries being stakeholders in the region because it's, uh, it's a win-win formula, it's beneficial. Um, and how do we maintain this? This is up to ASEAN and also to uh, all its partners. Um, and then uh, a second comment I'd like to make, um, and is, that's um, it is upon ASEAN to ensure that it remains a useful option for our partners. Uh, they have their own mechanism among them, uh, but ASEAN as a mechanism that is open and inclusive 
uh, needs to be useful as an option because various countries would have various options. Um, and ASEAN as an open and inclusive mechanism needs to be uh, useful. Uh, and that's why ASEAN itself, you know, last year my minister uh, asked her colleagues, uh, does ASEAN have the institutional wherewithal to address the current geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, tension? Uh, all her colleagues agree that uh, no, we need to review this. So um, currently, this is the, the work that is uh, being done, how to strengthen the uh, ASEAN mechanism, including the mechanism involving its dialogue partners. Thank you, Director General. And um, in a, a demonstration of uh, the Shangri-La Dialogue's respect for ASEAN centrality, I wanted to give the Secretary General uh, the last word. Well, thank you very much. I just want to add two quick points. One, of course, is that uh, ASEAN does not have a block within a block. That's why all sub-regional arrangements would have to invite us in the Secretary to participate to ensure transparency and openness. And this is the one thing. Uh, second, of course, on the regional comprehensive economic partnership. At the moment, we have 15 countries, 10 from ASEAN, uh, plus uh, China, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand. And at the moment, uh, uh, the uh, agreement had went into effect already on June 2nd. And uh, our ASEAN Economic Minister plus the uh, partners, uh, we are working to uh, finalize the OSAP support unit to be based at the ASEAN Secretariat. And we work out the funding arrangement from the contribution from all the uh, state member states. And we're also working for the accession uh, protocol to allow other countries to accede to uh, OSAP. And this is the world's largest FTA that we have. Thank you, Secretary General, Dr. Cao. I, I think one of the things that really came through in this panel is there is a level of introspection within ASEAN that was apparent on the panel and then also from many of the questions uh, that isn't always apparent in the public discussion about ASEAN centrality. And I'm glad we were able to host that conversation uh, here at the Dialogue, uh, hopefully in an open and inclusive way, and that uh, we can continue these conversations at the next Shangri-La Dialogue. So thank you for coming. Thank you to all the panelists for coming from uh, far away uh, to, to appear here. That concludes the session.